Join the coven. The siege of Area 51 will not end well. A story written by Weird Bryce Guy. As you may have expected, though probably not with the particularly correct prescience, the siege of Area 51 ended disastrously for everyone involved. How do I know? I was one of the deluded, though determined, congregation that stormed the base. Our numbers were minuscule in comparison to those who had pledged their participation online. But still, we raided as a formidable army. Hundreds sprinted collectively in a kind of mutually shared mania. Our speeds, though impressive, did not surpass those of bullets. The guards were posted in a perimeter around the base befitting any other military establishment. They hadn't expected a serious effort. At least, not one of our size. And when we approached Un Mas, bored, inexperienced, and sun-fatigued soldiers snapped to delayed attention. As we beleaguered the compound, some of us were immediately dispatched by on-site deterrence. Buried proximity sensors, activated anti-personnel turrets loaded with non-lethal rounds. Bodies fell in clusters and a sizable portion of our admittedly pitiful army immediately turned back towards their vehicles. Those of us that persisted determined to uncover the secrets of that legendary base continued the onslaught, armed with naught but our cameras, makeshift gadgets, and curiosity. I remember leaping over a fallen comrade, his eyes pouring tears as he dabbed delicately with a napkin and a large red mark on his forehead, where he had been struck by one of the automated defense system pellets. The group-born energy was quickly depleted in the face of the base's efficient weaponry. By the time myself and others reached the actual fence that enclosed the base, the guards had taken up a position of suppression which would have easily been our doom if some of us hadn't anticipated such quick failure before we had even set foot on the actual ground. No one had brought weapons so as to avoid being charged with any major felonies, though we had equipped ourselves with various devices which we believed to be inimical to the human psyche. Every manner of hypnotic and hallucinogenic construction was employed. Devices meant to stun, disorient, confuse, and befuddle, hastily prepared and not so expertly used. Most of the guards targeted merely laughed, while others seemed to succumb, albeit minimally, to the desired effects. However, this momentarily lapse in concentration and formation was all we needed and our sheer numbers collided with theirs to our favor. Upon breaching the perimeter fence, a great exultant roar could be heard as our forces tasted a small, yet totally unforeseen victory, and the guards who had been gatekeepers merely stood in disbelief. Though our numbers have been reduced to only a few dozen, we surged through the massive plot of land with as much fervor as before and dispersed into smaller groups to cover more ground. My group comprised of those who sought the answers to the Roswellian mysteries and hoped to capture images of an extra mundane nature entered a long and seemingly spacious building to the east of the compound. The building's construction suggested use as a hangar for an aircraft, and I'm sure you can guess what sort of aircraft we expected to find. More guards were present there, though we dispatched them without issue using our hypnotic gadgetry. Inside though, indeed a hangar, 
we found only the regular mundane aerial vehicles of earthen design. We maintained radio contact with the other groups, and to our great disappointment, they reported similar failure in uncovering any extraterrestrial artifacts. Strangely, the group that believed the base housed non-alien yet equally preternatural objects or presences hadn't reported their findings. My group unanimously agreed that this was troubling due to the group containing the hardiest and most devoted of our congregation. We set out to find the silent detachment, a flame of interest reignited within us. By then, our numbers had dwindled to a fraction of what we had first entered, most of them having been detained or slain by the armed personnel who saw our ransacking and loitering as troublesome, enough to warrant serious retaliation. Gunfire was heard, blood was smelled, and screams were unnervingly cut short all around us. My group came across a duo of rather trigger-happy guards who had just neutralized an entire gang of truth-seekers. And if it hadn't been for the sacrifice of a brave inquisitor, we would have all fallen. He charged at the guards, tackling them to the ground, allowing for us to escape into an unmarked building, whose stairs led into the earth. Behind us, we heard struggling, and the report of a rifle. The building stairs led down for a great distance, and though I was never particularly good with determining geographical scale, I am at least certain that our descent measured a mile, perhaps more. Concrete walls and stairs descended interminably. The passageway illuminated at intervals, by simple bulbs that dangled from chains affixed to the ceiling. We grew wary despite the downward trek, and two members fell from exhaustion. When we turned to help them up, they demanded we continue on. Eventually, we arrived at a large metal door with a simple crank serving as a knob. I turned the crank and after a strenuous effort managed to open the door, which revealed a massive, dimly lit room whose walls were lined with humming machinery. I recognized none of the devices and terminals that littered the room, nor did my companions, and most of what we saw seemed to be of a technological order several years beyond anything of our time. The room, a gallery of super scientific design. In the center of the room was a raised square black pad about 12 by 12 feet slightly bigger than a bedroom with a metal podium linked to machinery nearby a sort of lamp hung over the platform and a network of thick wiring and tubing led from the space into the unlit recesses of the room despite the ostensibly inert state of the machinery we heard and felt a consistent vibration emanate from the construction, a power of some kind that flowed to or from the weird platform. As we circled the thing, examining the various aspects of it, which I've related here, we at one point heard gunfire from the stairway we had left, and subsequently the agonized cries of the exhausted couple therein. Our awestruck examinations turned to panic, frantic searching, as we looked for some manner of defense from the attackers or escape from the room. No doors could be found, and the only items capable of being weaponized were several steel chairs placed before the bizarre machinery. Doubting our success against military combatants, I decided to try to make use of the focal pad. I had seen enough science fiction media to speculate that its use was of a transportive nature. Intuition and common sense allowed me to activate the machine to some degree, and the pad's overhanging lamp glowed hotly above us. 
Still determined to fight off the guards with chairs, my companions gathered at the door and attempted to bar it with a chair leg, leaving me to operate the machine. After a series of button presses of no particular order, the pad began emitting a low yet powerful hum, and a digital display on the podium began counting down from 30. A small screen to the left of this displayed a series of numbers which obviously pertained to date. And without needing a second of self-reassurance, I plotted a temporal location considerably before the current date. I practically leapt onto the pad, and just as I felt the vibrations and strange, inexpressible pulsations overcome my body, I saw the door-defending group blown back by some explosive device. What happened next, I cannot accurately describe. There was the sensation of dematerialization, of atomical destruction and subsequent reformation, and then a transference of form not across a physical distance, but through some more abstract, illimitable expanse, as if I were blasted to particles and my constituent debris remade elsewhere, among a wholly different sphere of existence. I do not know if it was through time or reality I traveled, if my instantaneous voyage was one of chronological reversal, or if I had been admitted to a reality where the entity resembling myself had not yet embarked on that ill-fated assault. If this is truly my original world, and I've defied the once irreversible current of time, then I can only warn you all of what will happen if you attend this stupid, perilous storm. If the machine's purpose is of an arguably grander nature, and I've been cast into a mirrored realm of my own, then my admonishment still stands. I'm not sure what to make of things. I feel as if I've merely been given a second chance in my own timeline. However, there are certain things which puzzle about this place. Namely, how no one in this realm seems to have heard of the recently declassified lunar compound that our group planned to siege after Area 51, where the secrets of the extinct anti-human lizard men are rumored to be kept. Despite what had happened during the first raid, I chose to return and hopefully uncover any overlooked secrets. Now that I knew there was a method of returning back in time, or at least to another reality in which the raid hadn't yet taken place. This time, the siege went mostly the same. Thousands charged, sprinting as fast as they could manage arms thrown back so as to achieve speeds far greater than a typical style of running. The automated defense system spat non-lethal rounds and expelled noxious gases, decimating our numbers and sending fractured groups fleeing away. The devices we had used during the first raid, handcrafted hypnotic devices and hallucinogenic elements, had the expected success rates, though this time a few chargers brought other, more dangerous tools. As I ran towards a noticeably unguarded section of the perimeter fence, a shadow fell over me, and upon looking up, I saw a man soaring through the air, his arms outstretched as if truly flying. I looked back and saw that among the horde were actual medieval siege engines, catapults, and trebuchets. Ballista and battering anchors built and placed atop low-roofed vehicles, which slowly drove towards the gates. The guards, having spotted the vehicles of war and the wild men launched by them, began assembling in defensive formations and firing upon the vehicles. Despite our reduced numbers, the sheer amount still present thronged about the gates, overwhelming the comparatively small assembly of soldiers, and after suffering only a few casualties, 
and the destruction of one engine, we, at last, entered the grounds of that enigmatic base. This is where the story differs greatly. The group with which I had splintered during my previous raid was mostly the same, though the two members who had fallen during the stairway incident were not among us this time. In their place was a man dressed in what could be best described as civilian tier combat gear. It hadn't the tactical aspects that would suggest military issue, but still seemed to be of a functionally useful nature. He hadn't disclosed to us what he held in the various pockets of his attire, but he did assume a position of leadership among us and directed us towards a squat dome capped building in the rear of the compound, far away from the building that housed the teleportation device I had used. We sprinted past small skirmishes, narrowly avoiding the unpredictable firing of crazed guards as they tried to combat the deluge of wild truth seekers. In the chaos of the day, morality seemed to have been abandoned. Despite our lack of arms, the guards fired at non-combative groups even some who had turned away to flee. Whatever secrets the base kept, they were apparently worth killing for. When we arrived at our destination, the self-assured leader had us wait in hiding while he attempted to unlock the door, which had a keypad affixed to its paneling at its side. As we waited, the six of us we heard strange sounds echo in the distance, and amidst the smoke and battle-thrown sand currents, I saw strange shapes skulk about. Though the specific details of their forms were hidden by the enshrouding plumes, the leader called us back, returned a hacking device of some sort to the pouch of his belt, and together we entered the mysterious building. The interior was brightly lit, and the metallic sheen of the equipment and machinery made me dizzy for a short while before my eyes managed to adjust. Unlike the machinery of the building I had entered during my ill-fated past raid, everything here was recognizable, and their purposes were plainly obvious. Computer terminals and lab equipment, mostly. It was a room for scientific study of a specifically biological nature. The objects of study, however, were far from familiar. Dear God, said someone beside me, I don't think God had anything to do with the creation of these things, responded our leader. In sophisticated cells, thickly glassed and reinforced by even thicker steel, were massive unmistakably alien creatures. There were three, each contained within their own cell. They appeared to be in sort of stasis, standing erect yet completely still. Three eyes sat deep within a round, noseless face, aligned in a distinctly triangular arrangement above a closed, thin-lipped mouth. There were no discernible ears, and their large heads were hairless. Faint, purplish skin was stretched across a tall, gaunt body, and slight translucency of the skin showed a complex, vascular system beneath the topmost dermis. A network of blue and pink veins spread through its six limbs. Two long, primary arms laid at its side, while two smaller, Vestigial appendages were curled against its chest. Its hands were balled into fists, preventing a count of its fingers. Multi-jointed legs, the length of our entire bodies held the beings upright, and ended in odd, squarish feet that resembled hooves. Though lacking the mammalian aspects of hair or keratin. I can't believe it! They're actually real! The woman who had spoken walked towards the middle cell, totally awed by the extra-mundane trio. The rest of us followed, careful 
to not bump anything that would awaken the dormant extraterrestrials. The sound of gunfire had died down, but the other sounds of ransacking doors being thrust open and shouts of surprise all persisted, and I assumed our forces had completely taken the base. We had time to breathe, but knowing the U.S. military, we didn't have much before a formidable attempt to reclaim the base was enacted. As we studied the creatures, noting various more intimate features such as small elevations of the skin under which ribs would be encased on a human, I couldn't help but feel that something was wrong. It was an inexplicable sense of unease, as if the advent of a vague horror loomed. It hadn't been the anticipation of the impending military action nor the finding of the aliens. They were, for the moment, harmless. After minutes of study when not much else could be learned from mere visual observation, we tried to access the data on the computers. Password protection locked them all. So our leader once again set to hacking. I was the only one who had heard the door close and lock behind us. I called out to our leader, who ceased his efforts and ran to the door. Before he could connect his device to the access panel, a bulkhead slammed down, nearly crushing him. All the monitors in the room turned off, and the light switched from their once blinding intensity to a dull red. An automated voice, vaguely female, announced that containment had been breached and sterilization procedures were underway. A man dressed in an MMA t-shirt, khaki shorts, and holding an energy drink shouted at the repeating message to stop and let us out. When his demands were ignored, as they obviously would be, he began pounding on the bulkhead. As his fists collided with the steel, I heard something stir in the room. I first glanced at the monitors, thinking they had turned back on but I was met with the same black screens as before. It wasn't until I looked everywhere else that my eyes landed on those three cells in which the aliens slept, ignorant to our presence, at least until the man who at one point shouted, Kyle wants out of here, started his tantrum. The alien in the rightmost cell shivered, as if blasted with cold air. Its eyes flickered, and its mouth opened and shut spasmodically. If it were human, I would have guessed that it had been having a seizure. Its hands unclenched, revealing three thick, pointed fingers, ending in talon-like protrusions. I called out to Kyle to stop his pounding and brought everyone's attention to the waking creature. Gasps were made all around, and a few curses as well. Kyle hopped up on whatever liquid energy he had been drinking, strode over to the cell. Bro, this thing is waking up. An educated man he was. And as the creature's eyes ceased their flickering, and the tri-numbered gaze landed on him, he chugged the rest of his drink and began a clumsy dialogue with the being. Hey man, we, uh, we uh, came to check you out, uh, see what they were hiding, and it's you! Ha ha, ha, yeah. The alien merely looked at the man, its face imparting no sense of hostility or even a comprehension of Kyle's nonsense. Hey, how do we let you out? Kyle gestured to the cell and pantomimed various ways in which he thought it could be opened. The alien, finally understanding, pointed a talon at a terminal a few feet away. Kyle motioned for the leader to come over, who approached hesitantly but did not unpack his tools. Are you sure this is a good idea? That thing doesn't look very friendly. The leader's words were true enough and I saw on the faces of our companions that they felt the same. We had come to find aliens, sure, but this colossal thing? 
didn't exactly look like something you'd want to have wandering around. Kyle, not at all perturbed by the creature's menacing stature, goaded the leader on while calling us a vulgar word that in its derogatory vein meant coward. The leader eventually gave in and attempted to access the terminal. After a series of button presses and dial shifting, he informed us that he couldn't gain access to our secret relief. Kyle, on the other hand, expressed his dissatisfaction loudly, as would a child denied some toy. Sorry, bro. We can't get to the controls. Do you know how? The alien glared at Kyle and raised its hand. He closed his three fingers so they formed a point, aiming it at Kyle. When the fingers were opened, Kyle jerked as if seized by some invisible force and began hovering a few feet from the floor, corresponding with the movement of the alien's hands. Kyle's body hovered backwards towards us, and with the retraction of the guiding hand, he was thrown rapidly against the cell. The psychokinetic puppetry continued, and Kyle's screams halted as his body finally cracked the glass. Dead, yet still controlled, a final slam broke a large chunk of the cell's front glass, and Kyle's limp body was then tossed aside. The alien stepped through the bloody threshold, stooping so as to avoid the jagged edges, and observed us with what appeared to be a grin of satisfaction. Oh, hell, I spoke this time, and the leader, who was the closest to the self-freed specimen, concurred with my statement, with his own expletive. We all backed away slowly, though... Our retreat was mostly an instinctual action. We still had no way of knowing of getting through the bulkhead that sealed the room. I hadn't come back just to die. So without any options of retreat and no choice of defending ourselves in combat against the towering horror, I raised up my hands in what I hoped would be recognized as a sign of peace. The alien mimicked my gesture. And for a second, I was filled with a sense of relief. Only a second, because an act of ultra-violence followed his beguiling mimicry. He again closed his hands and pointed them in the deadly way which indicated the use of his telekinetic abilities. And before I could even think, two of our group were seized by intangible tethers and slammed against the two unopened cells, back and forth. Their bodies flew until only bloodied masses remained. When the cells were finally opened, the alien tossed the remaining clumps of flesh at opposite walls, cratering the concrete. It then put its tips of its pointed hands together, closed its eyes, and began emitting a deep hum. A violet aura emanated from its body, which mixed with the containment procedure's red light to fill the room in a magenta haze. On each side of it, the aliens in the newly broken cells awoke and exited their cages. The first alien stopped the action that had aroused its brethren from their slumber. The remaining members of our group, myself, leader, and a couple that cowered under the table couldn't have hoped to stand up against the otherworldly beings if I hadn't been inspired by Kyle's brash ways. I grabbed a metal chair from one of the tables near me and without voicing my plan, tossed it at the aliens. As I had hoped, it was caught, suspended in midair by their powers. And after what I swear was a chuckle, tossed it back with an astounding force. I barely managed to dodge the projectile which collided with and destroyed a portion of the wall behind us. Daylight flooded the room. The leader, who had been standing, fear-struck the entire time, turned to me in wide-eyed surprise. I shouted at him and the hiding duo to run 
and we all sprinted through the hole. As I ran, I made sure to zigzag and turn around corners, hoping that by breaking line of sight, the aliens wouldn't be able to use their abilities on me. I shouted to my companions to do the same, despite my lack of certainty on this tactic. The base was in a state of severe disarray, with various sirens blaring as crowds surged throughout the campus. I saw people running with strange objects that I assumed were alien weaponry, while others rode gleefully atop wheelless hovering vehicles of alien design. We had claimed the base and plundered its bounty, but some secrets may not have been worth uncovering. I glanced back and saw that we had not been pursued by the released captives. I tried to warn people of their escape, even grabbing random raiders as they ran by, but no one paid attention and went on about their personal business. It was total chaos. It was only then that I noticed my companions and I had all dispersed and I was alone in the madness. Other groups ran by, oblivious to the impending threat, but I didn't want to link up only to be led to some other doom. I decided that this attempt was a complete failure. When the military arrived, if they didn't just start shooting the looters without discretion, they would probably start a battle with the aliens. As cool as it would be to see, I didn't want to be around when bullets and lasers or whatever the aliens shot started flying. My only recourse was to go back, to use the machine I had stumbled upon during my first siege. I ran towards the building in which it was housed, all the while dodging the flying vehicles that sped around the compound and the sometimes impassable hordes of people that still loitered around the general grounds. After several minutes, I had found it, and descended the massive stairs. I arrived at the door, opened it, and sped into the room towards the machine. I did the same series of actions that I had done before, and the machine started up with the same vibratory hums and pulsations that I remembered. I stepped on the pad, relieved that the nightmare would soon be over. Just as the strange teleportational forces washed over my body, another sensation seized me, and I felt a crushing pressure overwhelm me. I was frozen in place, held by some unyielding unseen grasp. To my horror, I saw a shadow fall upon the stairs, and a figure step through the doorway. The alien stood before me, its hand pointed. My assumption that it required sight of me to use its powers was proven false. It retracted its hand, meaning to pull me from the pad, but the machine's gravity contested it. The dual work of forces was agonizing, but I silently thanked the machine for its powerful hold on me, just as I felt myself slipping into unconsciousness from the terrible pain. Darkness overcame me and I was once again cast into that illimitable gulf of black, and then subjected to the paroxysm-inducing violence of temporal and dimensional travel. I came to cleared consciousness at my bed. I checked the date and sighed with great relief. I had returned once again to the past, well before the September storming of the raid. I stood and was about to go for a walk to clear the residual unease, but a scene flashed within my mind. I saw the alien that had followed me down into the room, which I had teleported from. It wasn't doing anything, merely standing and staring at the pad, but something about its manner made me afraid. My mind then cleared and the scene faded away. I shook away the image, chalking it up to trauma, and continued on. Before I could leave my room, I was beset by another series of images. Area 51 was a flaming graveyard. Its buildings were smashed and lay in crumpled heaps, some littered with bodies, while massive conflagrations burned within others. 
tanks, Humvees, and other vehicles were crushed into masses of crumpled metal or upturned and unoperable. Great piles of civilians and military personnel were stacked throughout the destruction. Night had come, and though the blazes illuminated only some of the carnage, I could tell that not a single human remained alive. The vision changed, and I was shown the teleporter's room. In it stood the three released aliens, surrounded by other beings of a somewhat similar morphology and color, though smaller and lacking the same number of appendages. The leading three stood before the pad and performed the same behavior that their leader had done to wake them from their stasis. I saw the pad glow and even heard its signature hum. A terror overcame me and the vision ceased. I felt tears slide down my cheeks. They were coming. They're obviously intelligent, perhaps far more than the smartest people of our species. I don't know if they can read our symbols, but I doubt they would need to operate the device by its intended mechanisms. Judging by the visions, I think some sort of space-time transcending link had been established between myself and the alien when he tried to seize me during transportation. They hadn't yet arrived, which made me think they couldn't transport directly to me without telling the machine to do so. Despite their apparent inability to read our language and symbols, something tells me that such things won't be an impenetrable barrier to their success. They'll find me. I'm sure of it. My only hope is to return to the base one last time and try to undo all that I had done. As you may have expected, though probably not with the particularly correct prescience, the siege of Area 51 ended disastrously for everyone involved. How do I know? I was one of the deluded, though determined, congregation that stormed the base. Our numbers were minuscule in comparison to those who had pledged their participation online. But still, we raided as a formidable army. Hundreds sprinted collectively in a kind of mutually shared mania. Our speeds, though impressive, did not surpass those of bullets. The guards were posted in a perimeter around the base befitting any other military establishment. They hadn't expected a serious effort, at least not one of our size. And when we approached Un Mas, bored, inexperienced, and sun-fatigued soldiers snapped to delayed attention. As we beleaguered the compound, some of us were immediately dispatched by on-site deterrence. Buried proximity sensors, activated anti-personnel turrets loaded with non-lethal rounds. Bodies fell in clusters and a sizable portion of our admittedly pitiful army immediately turned back towards their vehicles. Those of us that persisted determined to uncover the secrets of that legendary base continued the onslaught armed with not but our cameras, makeshift gadgets, and curiosity. I remember leaping over a fallen comrade, his eyes pouring tears as he dabbed delicately with a napkin at a large red mark on his forehead, where he had been struck by one of the automated defense system pellets. The group-born energy was quickly depleted in the face of the base's efficient weaponry. By the time myself and others reached the actual fence that enclosed the base, the guards had taken up a position of suppression, which would have easily been our doom if some of us hadn't anticipated such quick failure before we had even set foot on the actual ground. No one had brought weapons so as to avoid being charged with any major felonies. Though we had equipped ourselves with various devices which we believed to be inimical to the human psyche, 
Every manner of hypnotic and hallucinogenic construction was employed. Devices meant to stun, disorient, confuse, and befuddle, hastily prepared and not so expertly used. Most of the guards targeted merely laughed, while others seemed to succumb, albeit minimally, to the desired effects. However, this momentarily lapse in concentration and formation was all we needed, and our sheer numbers collided with theirs to our favor. Upon breaching the perimeter fence, a great exultant roar could be heard as our forces tasted a small, yet totally unforeseen victory, and the guards who had been gatekeepers merely stood in disbelief. Though our numbers have been reduced to only a few dozen, we surged through the massive plot of land with as much fervor as before, and dispersed into smaller groups to cover more ground. My group comprised of those who sought the answers to the Roswellian mysteries, and hoped to capture images of an extra mundane nature entered a long and seemingly spacious building to the east of the compound. The building's construction suggested use as a hangar for an aircraft, and I'm sure you can guess what sort of aircraft we expected to find. More guards were present there, though we dispatched them without issue using our hypnotic gadgetry. Inside though, indeed a hangar. We found only the regular mundane aerial vehicles of earthen design. We maintained radio contact with the other groups, and to our great disappointment, they reported similar failure in uncovering any extraterrestrial artifacts. Strangely, the group that believed the base housed non-alien yet equally preternatural objects or presences hadn't reported their findings. My group unanimously agreed that this was troubling due to the group containing the hardiest and most devoted of our congregation. We set out to find the silent detachment, a flame of interest reignited within us. By then, our numbers had dwindled to a fraction of what we had first entered most of them having been detained or slain by the armed personnel who saw our ransacking and loitering as troublesome, enough to warrant serious retaliation. Gunfire was heard, blood was smelled, and screams were unnervingly cut short all around us. My group came across a duo of rather trigger-happy guards who had just neutralized an entire gang of truth-seekers. And if it hadn't been for the sacrifice of a brave inquisitor, we would have all fallen. He charged at the guards, tackling them to the ground, allowing for us to escape into an unmarked building, whose stairs led into the earth. Behind us we heard struggling, and the report of a rifle. The building stairs led down for a great distance, and though I was never particularly good with determining geographical scale, I am at least certain that our descent measured a mile, perhaps more. Concrete walls and stairs descended intermittably, the passageway illuminated at intervals by simple bulbs that dangled from chains affixed to the ceiling. We grew wary despite the downward trek, and two members fell from exhaustion. When we turned to help them up, they demanded we continue on. Eventually, we arrived at a large metal door with a simple crank serving as a knob. I turned the crank and after a strenuous effort managed to open the door, which revealed a massive, dimly lit room whose walls were lined with humming machinery. I recognized none of the devices and terminals that littered the room, nor did my companions, and most of what we saw seemed to be of a technological order several years beyond anything of our time. The room, a gallery of super scientific design. In the center of the room was a raised 
square black pad, about 12 by 12 feet, slightly bigger than a bedroom, with a metal podium linked to machinery nearby. A sort of lamp hung over the platform, and a network of thick wiring and tubing led from the space into the unlit recesses of the room. Despite the ostensibly inert state of the machinery, we heard and felt a consistent vibration emanate from the construction, a power of some kind that flowed to or from the weird platform. As we circled the thing, examining the various aspects of it, which I've related here, we, at one point, heard gunfire from the stairway we had left, and subsequently, the agonized cries of the exhausted couple therein. Our awestruck examinations turned to panic, frantic searching, as we looked for some manner of defense from the attackers, or escape from the room. No doors could be found, and the only items capable of being weaponized were several steel chairs placed before the bizarre machinery. Doubting our success against military combatants, I decided to try to make use of the focal pad. I had seen enough science fiction media to speculate that its use was of a transportive nature. Intuition and common sense allowed me to activate the machine to some degree, and the pad's overhanging lamp glowed hotly above us. Still determined to fight off the guards with chairs, my companions gathered at the door and attempted to bar it with a chair leg, leaving me to operate the machine. After a series of button presses of no particular order, the pad began emitting a low yet powerful hum and a digital display on the podium began counting down from 30. A small screen to the left of this displayed a series of numbers which obviously pertained to date. And without needing a second of self-reinsurance, I plotted a temporal location considerably before the current date. I practically leapt onto the pad, and just as I felt the vibrations and strange inexpressible pulsations overcome my body, I saw the door-defending group blown back by some explosive device. What happened next I cannot accurately describe. There was the sensation of dematerialization, of atomical destruction and subsequent reformation, and then a transference of form not across a physical distance, but through some more abstract, illimitable expanse, as if I were blasted to particles and my constituent debris remade elsewhere, among a wholly different sphere of existence. I do not know if it was through time or reality I traveled, if my instantaneous voyage was one of chronological reversal, or if I had been admitted to a reality where the entity resembling myself had not yet embarked on that ill-fated assault. If this is truly my original world, and I've defied the once irreversible current of time, then I can only warn you all of what will happen if you attend this stupid, perilous storm. If the machine's purpose is of an arguably grander nature, and I've been cast into a mirrored realm of my own, then my admonishment still stands. I'm not sure what to make of things. I feel as if I've merely been given a second chance in my own timeline. However, there are certain things which puzzle about this place. Namely, how no one in this realm seems to have heard of the recently declassified lunar compound that our group planned to siege after Area 51 where the secrets of the extinct anti-human lizard men are rumored to be kept.